Good morning and welcome on this beautiful spring morning. We're going to sing three songs today. Come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, worshiper, lover of believing, ours is no caravan of despair. Come, yet again, come. Come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, worshiper, lover of believing, ours is no caravan of despair. Come, yet again, come. Up above my head, I hear music in the air. Up above my head, I hear music in the air. Up above my head, I hear music in the air. I really do believe, really do believe there's joy somewhere. Up above my head, there is trouble everywhere. Up above my head, there is trouble everywhere. Up above my head, there is trouble everywhere. I really do believe, really do believe there is hope somewhere. Up above my head, there is justice in the air. Up above my head, there is justice in the air. Up above my head, there is justice in the air. I really do believe, really do believe there is truth somewhere. Up above my head, there is sorrow in the air. Up above my head, there is sorrow in the air. Up above my head, there is sorrow in the air. I really do believe, really do believe there is peace somewhere. Up above my head, I hear singing everywhere. Up above my head, I hear singing everywhere. Up above my head, I hear singing everywhere. I really do believe, really do believe there is love somewhere. Go yonder, go yonder, and sing to the people. Voices of courage resounding and strong. Tell all the lonely, the frightened and mourning. Tell all the people, together we're strong. Go yonder, go yonder, and pray for the people. Send out your blessing, your hope and your love. Prayers of resilience, compassion and power. Our love is as wide as the blue sky above. Go yonder, go yonder and sing to the people. Voices of courage resounding and strong. Tell all the lonely, the frightened and mourning. Tell all the people, together we're strong. Nicolay, you're still muted. Sorry, everyone, my mistake. Let's try this again. Good morning and welcome everyone to White Bear Unitarian Universalist Church. I am Nicolay Lyon, she, her, serving on your board of directors. Service participants today include Amy Peterson Derrick, Reverend Sarah Goodman, Carol Coet, and Victoria Safford, supported by Aaron Scott. Music today is from Carol Coet and the WB UUC Choir, directed by Thaxter Cunio and supported by Steve Gorenson. Today, after the service at 1115, we hope that you will join us for Cyber Social Hour. We'll put the Zoom link and easy instructions in the chat box. 
In April and May, we hope you'll take part in congregational conversations about how and when we will be able to gather in person at church. Please come to share your questions, concerns, and ideas. Watch the e-news on Monday and Thursday for an easy registration link. Our 2021 pledge campaign will fund the budget in the coming year. We're on the threshold of exciting changes, welcoming a new minister and planning for gradual return to in-person gatherings. To support our thriving congregation, our goal this year is $920,000, a lean and prudent budget. As of this morning, we have raised $840,000 from 321 households, which is amazing in this pandemic year. Thank you to everyone who's made a pledge so far. This week, volunteers from the Pledge Committee and the Board of Directors will begin phone calls to help bring our campaign to a close. Please save us a step. Click on the link here and make your pledge today. And if you're unable to pledge this year for any reason, please click on the link and tell us your pledge will be zero. That will save time for people making calls. Thanks, everyone. And we're almost there. Welcome all to our church. Together, we grow our souls and serve the world. Come in, come into this space which you make holy by our presence. Come in with all your vulnerabilities and strengths, fears and anxieties, loves and hopes. For here you need not hide nor pretend nor be anything other than who you are and who you are called to be. Come into this space where we can heal and be healed, forgive and be forgiven. Come into this space where the ordinary is sanctified, the human is celebrated, the compassionate is expected. Come into this space. Together, we make it a holy space. And welcome. Becky Panch will light our chalice. Hello, everyone. The theme for the month of April is mortality, the practice of being alive. I recently reached a 25 year milestone working as a music therapist in hospice care. People often ask me, how can you do this work? How can you be around so much dying and so much grief? I often tell people that I'm not really helping people die. What I'm doing is helping people live until the moment that they die. And it also helps keep perspective on my own life. I often hear my mother's voice saying, Becky, there's always someone worse off than you. So pre appreciate what you have. Never has that been more true than during this time of the pandemic. There have been so many people so much worse off than I, and I feel lucky to be alive. I feel blessed to be continuing to work and do what I do. I also get to be around so much kindness and compassion. My coworkers are some of the best people on the planet. And at the end of someone's life, often the things that are unimportant just fade away. And the things that are most true and uh, most important are the things that shine through. So I get to see the best in people. Not, not the worst, the best. Mary Oliver wrote a poem called When Death Comes. And I'd like to read for you just the ending part of it. It says... When it's over, I want to say all my life, I was a bride married to amazement. I was the bridegroom taking the world into my arms. When it's over, I don't want to wonder if I have made of my life something particular and real. I don't want to find myself sighing and frightened or full of argument. I don't want to end up simply having visited this world. I light the chalice today for those of us who want to be more than just visitors to this world, people that want to be married to amazement.
Join me in our opening words. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love and to help one another. The hymn is Lo the Earth Awakes Again, number 61. Today's story is called The Rebirth of the Sun, and it's by Starhawk from Circle Round. Circle Round, and I'll tell you a story about when the sun was born again, bringing life and green to the earth. All year long, the sun had worked very hard, rising and setting day after day. All year long, the sun had fed everybody on earth, shining and shining, giving energy to the trees and the flowers and the grasses so they could grow and feed the animals and birds and insects and people. Now the poor sun could barely make it up in the morning and after a very short time needed to sleep again. And so the days grew shorter and the nights grew longer until the day that the day was so short it was hardly worth getting up for at all. Night felt sorry for the sun, so night wrapped her great arms around the sun, and the night was very long indeed. The sun rested and rested some more, and so did the trees and the flowers and the grasses. Why does the dark go on so long, asked children all over the earth. Come back, sun, they pleaded, come back. Slowly, the sun began to wake, slowly, slowly. But the children missed rolling in the grasses and smelling the flowers and sitting in the shade of the trees. Oh, sun, they cried, please stay up just a little longer. We want to play in your warmth. The sun is still very tired, the old one said. But maybe, just maybe, if you children say thank you for all the things the sun does, the light may return in the morning. And so the sun, the children sang songs to the sun. They thought about all the things the sun gave them. Thank you for growing the lettuces and the corn and the rice and the wheat, they said. 
Thank you for growing the trees of the forests and the seaweed and the oceans and the krill that feeds the whales. Thank you for stirring the air and making the wind that brings the rain. And every time a child said, thank you, the sun began to feel a little warmer, a little brighter. Wrapped still safely in the arms of night, sun grew younger and younger still. At last, the children had to go to bed. We will stay up and wait for the sun to rise again, the old ones said. Early in the morning, the old ones woke the children, and together they climbed a high hill and faced to the east, the direction of the sunrise. They sang more songs to the sun and ran around trying to keep warm. And they waited and waited to see what the dawn would bring. The sky began to turn from black to indigo to blue, and slowly the sky grew light. A golden glow crept over the horizon and night opened her great arms and in a burst of brightness, the sun appeared new and strong and shining. Ice began to give way to trickling waters in the brook. The crocus, tulips, and violets poked through the dewy soil and grasses started to reach, reach up to the warmth of the sun. Everybody cheered and the children jumped up and down. The sun has returned, the sun is reborn, the people cried, and they danced and sang to celebrate the birth of a new day. And then they went home to breakfast. Your financial gift to our congregation supports the programs we rely on as anchors in our lives gathering space and materials for children, youth, and families, choral rehearsals and music, classes and small groups, public witness, pastoral care, rites of passage, Sunday services. You can contribute to the offering today by sending a check or by following the easy prompt to text to give. Thank you for your generous support. First reading is from John Muir. In the ancient North, they spoke of death as Heimgang, home going. So the snowflowers go home when they melt and flow to the sea, and the rock ferns, after unrolling their fronds to the light and beautifying the rocks, roll them up close again and blend with the soil. Myriads of rejoicing living creatures daily, hourly, 
every moment sink into death's arms, dust to dust, spirit to spirit, waited on, watched over by their maker, each arriving at its own heaven. All the merry dwellers of the trees and streams and the swarms of the air called into life by the sunbeam of a summer morning go home through death, wings folded perhaps in the last red rays of sunset of the day they were first tried. Trees towering in the sky, braving storms of centuries, flowers turning faces to the light for a single hour, having enjoyed their share of life's feast, all alike pass on. They are our family. They enjoy life as we do. They come with us out of eternity and return to eternity. And look now, the snow is melting into music. The second reading is from Ross Gay. Thank you. If you find yourself half naked and barefoot in the frosty grass, hearing again the earth's great sonorous moan that says you are the heir of the now and gone, that says all you love will turn to dust and will meet you there, do not raise your fist. Do not raise your small voice against it and do not take cover. Instead, curl your toes into the frosted grass. Watch the cloud ascending from your lips. Walk through the garden's dormant splendor. Say only, thank you. Thank you. Our next reading is Hope Weed by J. Barry Shepherd. Our Christian symbols seem at times not quite appropriate to the meaning that they bear. For instance, take the Easter lily, white and fragile sign of resurrection. Rare, its graceful silent trumpet greets the light of March or April only under the glare of florist lamps, unnaturally bright. You never find them in the open air before July. A better flower for Easter day would be, as every angry gardener knows, the dandelion, seated by the gay abandoned wind that, as it listeth, blows. No matter how we weed out every stray, digging as deep, the roots still deeper goes. And when at last we quit and go away, the rain falls and a host of fresh, bright faces resurrected and the garden grows. The next and last reading is an excerpt from Fearless by Tim Siebels. 
Good to see the green world undiscouraged, the green fire bounding back every spring. The weeds and other co-conspiring green genes ganging up, breaking in, despite small shear and kill mowers, ground gougers and seed eaters. Here they come, sudden as graffiti, not there and then there, naked, hun humble, unrequitedly green growing as if they would be trees on any unmanned patch of earth, any sidewalk cracked crooning between ties on lonesome railroad tracks and moss, the shyest green citizen anywhere, tiptoeing the trunk in the damp shade of an oak. Clear a quick swatch of dirt and come back sooner than later and find the green friends moved in, their pitched tent, the first bright leaves hitched to the sun. Is it possible to be so glad? The shoots rising in spite of every plot against them, every chemical stupidity, every burned field, every better home and garden finally overrun by the green will, the green greenness of green things growing greener. Our hymn is Rising Green, number 1068. April, a year ago exactly, in the week of the first full moon following the vernal equinox, I read a piece by someone reflecting on their first pandemic Passover and what it meant to hold a Seder, the Passover meal, 
around a table with no relatives, no friends, no children, no grandmother bustling in with her chicken soup, no aunt and uncle with their perfect spring asparagus, nothing but an iPad zooming in the tiny faces of her large extended family and her own dinner, a piece of matzah with butter and a cup of wine poured for the prophet Elijah. The writer observed, as everyone at every Seder since the Red Sea parted has observed, that Passover is not an ancient story. It's a story unfolding in this moment right now. In my whole life till now, she wrote, we always celebrated having come through the plagues a very long time ago, back when everything was myth, when Cinderella and Moses and Blackbeard the pirate all lived with equal weight in a world that always drove toward a happy ending. But we have a plague here now before us. What does it mean, plague? What does it mean to want to be passed over? What are we afraid of today? How will we think about this holiday in the future if we get to spend it again with other people? Is it right to celebrate buttered matzah with salt when that's not much, but also it's quite a lot? And we're so sick of each other in these four walls, but losing each other or these four walls would be the worst thing that could ever happen. Where will we all be next year? And here we all are still asking. The ancient story of exodus and plague and wondering where we're headed is happening right now. And similarly, Easter this year and every year, I don't know about the Christian theology of Easter, the faith that rests assured the dead will rise again embodied and redeemed. I don't know about vicarious atonement or anything about the old theology insisting fervently that somehow one innocent martyr can carry the weight, should bear all the weight of everybody's sin. I don't know about that old theology. It never could add up for me, though for some I know it's sacred and it's powerful. And yet I do know, I do believe that parts of this strange, old, sad, and glorious, confusing story are playing out right now in real time, in our own time, and they are literally true. I do know that I've seen death and resurrection. I have stood, and likely you have too, in a barren, wasted place with the loss of someone whom I loved howling through me, someone cherished whom I needed, whom I sort of thought in the way we all think about everyone we know, whom I sort of thought would never die because we don't think that way, we can't. And then they do and we are left bereft, adrift, a little dead ourselves. Talking about grief. We are summoned then to something we might not have believed was possible nor wanted to believe because it feels almost like the trail of the person that you love, the person that you lost. Somewhere, sometimes in the course of grief, we are summoned to believe that this life, our own life is good and beautiful, that this whole life, this living world is lovely and a gift. And we wanna see it through even broken, broken hearted as we are. One morning, when we least expect it could be possible, we notice the light as it moves across the kitchen floor. We hear again, after months or years of silence, the juncos scolding squirrels at the feeder. We pick up the phone to the voice of a friend and we answer. And something dead inside us is literally reborn. In grief, we can't believe, would rather not believe in life at all. And then by grace, by chance, by birdsong, by our will or against our will, through the kindness of friends and the friendliness of strangers, by miracle, the ice cracks, our hearts break completely apart and we find they are still beating. We rise again to greet the day, not cured of grief, never that, but healing not cured, but curious again 
about what will happen next, what happy thing, however small, might happen to us next. That's the only theology I can sift out of the Easter story. And it's a small but mighty thing. Love in the face of death, life and light and breath and hope, resilience in the face of death. That is no small thing. These old stories are not ancient history at all. We're still telling them, still writing them, still learning to live in their paradoxes. Passover, where people under the weight of unspeakable oppression, tyrants without holding them in bondage, demons within holding us in bondage. Somehow the people get the idea to walk out. They choose the risk of leaving over the risk of languishing, the risk of not choosing at all. They join their hands, lock arms, head into the desert of unknowing, singing freedom into being as they go. It's one of the oldest stories in the Bible, and it happens all the time. Easter, where people under the weight of unspeakable grief and also oppression, a murderous state, they find in memory and love and gratitude enough light to go by, enough hope to go on, and thus does their teacher live on, and thus does the teaching live on. These are stories of crocus-like courage. We are summoned in this life, believers or not, to act as if our backbones, our spines, were as strong as the fragile stems of those tiny green spikes, defying snow and ice and concrete and layers of black rotting leaves just to rise and shine, knowing all the while, as maybe flowers do. Who knows what flowers know? Knowing all the while that this life is wondrous and it is worth it and it's short. So why not shine? You're gonna die, we all are. So why not bloom? Open all your purple yellow petals to the sun. Be a little reckless. That's what spring in Minnesota teaches us. Be reckless with your love. The poet Ross Gay gives hard and sound advice in his poem called simply, thank you. If you find yourself half naked and barefoot in the frosty grass, hearing again the earth's great sonorous moan, that says all you love will turn to dust and will meet you there, don't raise your fist. Don't raise your small voice against it and don't take cover. Instead, curl your toes into the frosted grass. Watch the cloud ascending from your lips. Walk through the garden's dormant splendor. Say only, thank you, thank you. Life and death dance round and round. And I love those old lines from John Muir, who loved the mountains and the living land. So the snow flowers go home when they melt, he said, and flow to the sea. And trees towering in the sky, braving storms of centuries, flowers turning faces to the light for a single hour, all alike pass on and away under the law of death and love. They are our family. They enjoy life as we do, share blessings with us, die and are buried in the same hallowed ground. They come with us out of eternity and return to eternity. And look now, the snow is melting into music. Everything goes round and round. This life is no straight line, but a circle. So be careful what you wish for, because to wish for full on spring in April is to wish for high summer. And to wish for summer is to wish for fall, which dies to winter round and round. To wish for green grass in April is to wish for the possibility of frosted grass and sometimes snow on Easter, you know that. To wish for freedom from the slavery of Egypt meant the people had to wander for decades in the terror of the desert before they found their way to wish their teacher resurrected back to life meant the people had to take upon themselves the burden of his teaching. 
his crazy radical ideas about justice and mercy and money and power and love. Be careful what you wish for and then take it on. Two poets speak of gardening in the spring. J. Barry Shepherd, a white Presbyterian minister from Scotland, and Tim Seibels, a renowned Black poet born and raised in Philadelphia. He's a former poet laureate of Virginia. And he says, good to see the green world undiscouraged, the green fire bounding back every spring, the weeds and other co-conspiring green genes, here they come, sudden as graffiti, naked, unhumble, unrequitedly green, growing as if they would be trees on any unmanned patch of earth, any sidewalk cracked crooning between ties on lonesome railroad tracks and moss, the shyest green citizen. Is it possible to be so glad? The shoots rising in spite of every plot against them, every chemical stupidity, every burned field, every better home and garden finally overrun by the green will, the green greenness of green things growing greener. Be careful what you wish for when you head out into your barren garden in the early spring in Minnesota. Pray for green and green's gonna come, raucous and abundant, though not exactly the green you had in mind all winter as you paged through seed catalogs, dreaming of roses and orderly rows and dahlias and lettuce and beets. Be careful what you wish for in this life when you wish for more life because life is wild and creative and headstrong and fearless. And it's gonna take you where you did not expect to go, chasing creeping Charlie all over the yard till you finally give in and call it your crop. Everything in this life requires more flexibility and laughter and imagination and work than we ever imagined. And also more wonder as volunteer pumpkins sprout out of the compost. Likewise, Barry Shepard, who wonders why lilies get pride of place on Easter, fussy and obnoxious and sort of out of season as they are. Our Christian symbols seem, he says, not quite appropriate to the meaning that they bear. A better flower for Easter day would be, as every angry gardener knows, the dandelion, seated by the gay abandoned wind that as it listeth blows. No matter how we weed out every stray, digging as deep the root still deeper goes. And when at last we quit and go away, the rain falls and a host of fresh bright foes stands resurrected and the garden glows. Shepherd calls the dandelion hope weed. Be careful. Pray for beauty. And you just might get it. Yellow, tenacious, easy to grow and everywhere. We try to make order our own kind of aesthetic, but sometimes something different ensues, a wilder, older order than our own minds can imagine. Crazy, holy order that calls the weed as worthy as the lily, the slave as worthy as the pharaoh. And the least of these, the rightful worthy heirs to the kingdom of heaven, the least of these, said Jesus, meaning everybody on the margins, is worthy, meaning the children in detention at the border this morning, meaning the Asian woman beaten in New York last week while passersby passed by and onlookers looked on, 65 years old. She was on her way to church. And hours later in that same city, an Asian man was beaten on the subway till he lost consciousness. And there are so many more as racist violence rises against AAPI people. The old stories, they're unfolding right before our eyes. And tables could be turning right now in the temples of power if we wished for that. But be careful, or at least be mindful, or at least be intentional about what you wish for in this life. Pray for justice, pray for peace, and it might just look like revolution 
restoration, restitution, resurrection, reparation, and you will be summoned, you will be called to make it so. The parched desert could overflow with milk and honey if we wanted that enough. March Piercy, the poet, talks about the prophet Elijah, Eliyahu, for whom the door is left open and a cup of wine poured at every Passover Seder. In every generation you return, she says, speaking what few want to hear, words that burn us, that cut us loose so we can rise upward, open the door for Eliyahu that he may come in. You come as a wild man, as a homeless sidewalk orator. You come as a woman taking the bima, the rabbi's place in temple. You come in prayer and song, open the door for Eliyahu that she may come in. There are moments for each of us when you summon, when you call down the whirlwind, when you shake us like a rattle, then we too must become you and rise. Open the door for Eliyahu that we may in. I think of this, of prophets, and their call to testify, to turn the world and the tables completely upside down. And I think of witnesses we've heard all week in the trial in Minneapolis, and the courage of people, their dignity, their integrity, their humility, their humanity, some of them children, some EMTs a teenage store clerk, a firefighter, a police sergeant, a police lieutenant, people on the street that day who did not pass by or look away, each of them caught up now in this terrible passion play that none of them auditioned for. Young people, old people, ordinary, each trying their best to remember rightly what they'd rather forget, what they saw, what they heard, what they said, what they did, trying to speak truth with the whole world watching on court TV. I think of prophets and their call to testify. And these people, one after another, saying variously, I wish I had done more. I wish I could have done more to help to help save the man I saw killed there that day. And I hope somehow they can hear us, millions of us, whispering assurance, holding them in prayer through this ordeal, saying, child, there is nothing more that you could do. We've got you, child of God. We've got this together because we are careful what we wish for. We are mindful. We're deliberate in our call for justice, our call for peace. And we know the stakes are high. We know it means we have to hold the work together, carry the story together, choose life and love and hope all together, not alone. For thus does this world move not only round and round, but forward on and on. The story says, that long ago, the followers of Jesus, his friends, the strange and raggedy companions, whose names we maybe know, but probably not really, the ones who were present long ago made a choice, first each alone, then together, to rise from their sadness at the tomb in the morning, rise up and run holding the love of their teacher, their friend, his vision, his words, like ribbons in their hands and weaving memory as they went, and stories. They chose to carry forward out of their grief, out of his death, what they knew about life, about justice, compassion, radical love, against the money changers, against the war makers, the defilers of beauty, against all the odds. They chose life, like crocuses, like daffodils, like creeping Charlie and milkweed and tulips and dandelions. They chose, as we do, to rise and shine, to answer the gift of this life with the gift of our lives and let our living be for gladness and for hope. That is the only theology that I can sift out of Easter and Passover and spring. Rise and shine. 
And it's no small thing. For just a few moments, let's breathe together. In the beauty of this morning, the miracle of the day, breathe deep the breath of life, the spirit of life, trusting that in this moment we're together, even though we're apart. For a few moments in gratitude and wonder, let's hold silence together. This morning, we hold those who are struggling with loneliness or loss, with sickness, with mental illness or depression. We hold those who live with addictions and all who love them and care for them. We hold those who are tired or can't find their way. We hold our children and their parents and our beloved elders with gratitude and love into the silence here and out of it. I invite you now to speak the names of those you're holding in your heart, speak them silently or speak them right out loud and trust that we're holding them with you. And all of a sudden, without warning, Though we'd long expected it in our bones and in our blood, in the sticky sap and marrow of the soul, all of a sudden, without warning, the morning wind blew gentler. The white cold moon burned warmer. Our lake ice cracked and robins flew out, freed onto the muddy grass. Red winged blackbirds flew out laughing, clinging to the reeds. All of a sudden, without warning, Something led us out with an outstretched arm and a mighty hand. Something promised us rebirth, the resurrection of our hoping. Something rolled the stone away. The rain rained down loud, clear and wet, not silent, thick and white. And without warning, winter washed away and we were blinking in the sunlight, free. Spirit of life and love moving now in every lively living thing and in us, through us, all among us like the wind, astonish us this morning. Startle us and stun us, shake us from our sleeping, for we are winter weary, we're sluggish, disbelieving, and we are ready, we are more than ready to sing our alleluias to what's rising from the dead to sing and shout our hymns of praise to every green and living thing that's rising from the dead. You are the face of God. I hold you in my heart. You are a part of me. You are the face of God. You are the face of love. I hold you in my heart. You are my family. You are a part of me. You are the face of hope. I hold you in my heart. You are a light for me. You are the face of hope. You are the face of God. I hold you in my heart. You are a part of me. You are the face of God. Please join me in the closing words. May peace dwell within our hearts and understanding in our minds. May courage steal our will and love of truth forever guide us.
Thank you everyone for joining us today. At 11.15, in a few minutes, you're invited to Cyber Social Hour, an informal half hour with old friends and new. Today, we hope you'll bring a sign of spring to share or show off your Easter basket or a festive bonnet that maybe matches your Sunday best Easter pajamas. Kids and adults are all welcome. And if you prefer to just come as you are with no signs of spring and no festive hat, we're gonna welcome you just the same. We're sending love to you this morning from St. Paul and Stillwater from Woodbury and from 328 Maple Street in Matamidi. Be well, everybody. <laughs>